Ivy Ridge was a privately owned behavior modification program that existed from 2001 until 2009. These were incredibly common throughout the 80s, 90s, and even the early 2000s. They were usually referred to as military schools or other programs such as STARS or CHAMPS. They were transparent with their tactics, so both parents and children knew what the deal was. Troubled kids would be shipped and taught discipline and responsibility. Ivy Ridge, however, wasn't like that. This academy branded itself as a real boarding school where legitimate education went on. This isn't the case though, as I'm sure we all learned from the program documentary. Like the filmmakers explained, there were a number of sister schools that operated in many other states and countries. The original Ivy Ridge operated out of New York State, but its abusive fingers reached all over the world. Only after the documentary came out did I learn that one of my best childhood friends from school was abducted inside his home in the middle of the night. He and I met in sixth grade and became fast pals, especially when I learned that he moved into the house just around the corner from mine. For two years, we waited at the same bus stop, crushed on the same girls, and had our first taste of alcohol together on a cloudy afternoon inside my empty house. We did everything together, from riding bikes to trampoline hopping, getting in trouble at school and taking the punishment as a team. Then one day, his stepdad moved him away, and I never saw him again. Flash forward 15 years, we found one another on Facebook. Fast forward another five, this documentary comes out, and it took me almost 20 years to figure out where my friend went and why. This is his story. Out of respect for him and his family, all of the names will be changed for privacy. Everything else is the truth about being a student at Ivy Ridge. Admittedly, he said that almost all of his memories from being at the school were blocked out until that documentary itself was released. Like the introduction explained, my stepdad and I moved back to the city after my mom died. Originally, it was him, my mom, and myself. She was in a car accident not long after the move. Unfortunately, she was killed. That left me and my stepdad in a house that we barely moved into. I can't even express the amount of distance between us after that event happened. We were both just becoming shells. We didn't know how to help ourselves, let alone help each other. So, we just started to become complete strangers. Without my mom, I was just a boy, and he was just a man. We didn't have that same father-son bond anymore. So that's where I went, back to the city. I didn't live with my stepdad for long though. We were both going through the motions of grief and mourning. And being two guys, we would clash a lot. It was turning into blow-ups, shouting matches. Then suddenly, he was just checked out, not even around. My next landing pad was with my aunt and my uncle, my mom's sister, so actually blood at least. But at this point, I was damaged goods. Walking, talking anger, and I wasn't afraid to show it. I was furious at everything and everyone, and I didn't know how to deal with it so I would lash out whenever the opportunity arose. I had a little brother who I started picking on too, just to help cope with losing my mom. I wanted everyone around me to feel the same pain that I was feeling. I'm sure that's obvious to you, but it's therapeutic for me to say in here now. As you might imagine, I wasn't kind to my aunt or uncle either. They knew I was a ticking time bomb, showed no signs of improving, so they started doing their own research for alternative methods of care. These were working class people with kids of their own, their own lives and obligations that they had going on. Now, they had two additional kids on top of that. We were totally miserable. They looked into military school and a number of other similar options. They stumbled upon the academy at Ivy Ridge and were immediately sold on it. It was catering to the desperate and delusional. People who thought they were really there for a quick fix or what was generally considered a problem child. The pamphlets and website were loaded with those buzzwords. Behavior modification, surprise removal, total containment and observation, promised results. It was a golden ticket for people who were looking to get out from underneath the burden of parenting. So that's what they did to me. I was woken up at 2.51 in the morning, yanked out of bed by my feet, and instantly handcuffed behind my back. The lights came on and I was surrounded by men I didn't know. I started to scream. They were big, wearing dark clothes, menacing, everything they were supposed to be. 
When I started screaming and crying and fighting back, they hauled me to my feet and by the scruff of my neck told me to shut up. Obedience would be a big part of my new life, and the faster I understood that, the easier my enrollment would be. I was absolutely sure that I was being abducted, but when I saw my aunt and uncle waiting in the living room, just sitting on the couch, I realized everyone was in on this. These people were supposed to be in the house, had even been let in, and now they were taking me with them. My bad attitude had finally resulted in a real world consequence that would have an effect on me for the rest of my life. They dragged me out to the transport van and nothing but my boxers. I was 15, a sophomore in high school, and more scared than I've ever been in my entire life. It wasn't just my bad behavior, but explicit drug use, as well as being kicked out of multiple schools for fighting. All I could think about was every bad thing that I did, every bad thing that had ever happened to me, and how it was all catching up with me in the van. This was the day after Christmas, so I went from feeling fear to overwhelming depression. This is where I was supposed to be. No family, no friends, just strangers driving me to a prison, being paid to do so. Like I said, all I had on was my underwear, and I sat in the back of the van. It was a good five or six hour transport, and honestly, I couldn't tell you how much time had gone by. These guys didn't care at all. There was nothing I could say or do to convince them to give me anything else to wear, let alone something to eat or drink. It was kidnapping in the purest sense of the word. Anytime I spoke up or tried to get out of my restraints, I just catch a backhand and a lot of yelling. This being so new, I didn't understand that I was biting off way more than I could chew. I thought they would get tired of abusing me, or maybe once they saw that it didn't work, they'd move on to something else. That was never the case though. I can honestly tell you that nearly every single person that I encountered enjoyed tormenting the children to at least some degree. A lot of the bigger guys in charge of the physical discipline honestly just loved kicking our asses, and you could tell. They made no effort to hide it. Little smirks and smiles, laughs, just the general body language of doing the abuse was always so casual, like, can you believe this? Getting paid to beat these kids up? Once I finally calmed down and leveled myself out, I just kept asking, where are we going? It's a school. It helps kids like me. Where is it? I asked. You'll see, was all they said. It's hard to describe. The place is amazing. It's like a summer camp. Then why am I being handcuffed? Because leaving home can be scary. This is a program for troubled youth, so a lot of the kids we pick up are ready to fight or run the first chance that they get. It's just risk management, nothing personal. Then they gave me the icing on top. When will I get out? I asked. Usually by the end of the weekend, guy said. It's not forever, just a speed bump to get you back on track. You'll be better for it. I remember actually smiling, relieved. I didn't speak the rest of the ride. I went from the home that I shared with my aunt and uncle to one of the most notorious WASP centers in the program, Cross Creek Academy. This was one of the first schools to pop up on the radar for the program, and where some of the most heinous shit in America was going on. The allegations are unbelievable, but as I was arriving, I didn't know any of this. All I knew was that I was pissed off in an unfamiliar place, and as far as I was concerned, I was completely on my own. Especially after the 3 a.m. betrayal at my aunt's house, I didn't know who to trust. The two guys that drove me offloaded me at a receiving center. I walked in my underwear into a holding room where there was a different guy, plus a couple of other kids. They told me to strip down, which took a lot of convincing on their part, and then did a full strip search. Bending over, jumping up and down, turning my head and coughing, everything you can imagine. Again, I'm 15 and being inspected by adults. Once they were satisfied, I was given a bright yellow shirt, khakis, and a pair of shoes without laces. It was obvious this was anti-flight material. I couldn't run without laces, and the shirt made me stand out like nobody's business. After that, I got put into a holding cell with the rest of the new kids from that day. There were 10 or 12 of us, all wearing the same stupid clothes, laid up in a little office that only had chairs in it. These were the only kids that I was allowed to talk to that day. Everyone else was on a level and already in the program. They weren't allowed to socialize with us, other than giving us direct orders. 
I didn't speak much. I just watched everyone else, too suspicious to share anything about myself. The other kids talked up a storm, where they're from and what they did to get sent away, what they like to do for fun, and what they thought the school would actually be like. It was like being in detention in school all over again. Everyone was kind of fronting, telling all these tall tales, acting tough. It was all an act, because just under the surface, we were all obviously terrified. No one had any color in their face. Everyone's hands were shaking, even if we were talking about how hard we were. Then the staff came back in, alongside the leader students. They started breaking down the rules for all of us. We learned that Cross Creek Academy was actually two schools. The manor, which was only girls, and the center, where we currently were, was all boys. I looked around and sure enough, everyone inside the room was indeed a guy. I'd be lying if I said I could remember every little rule, as literally everything was off limits. We couldn't even so much as look at the girls when we crossed paths with them. If we did, there would be consequences, because there were consequences for everything. Talking too fast, walking too slow, being too loud, being too quiet. Nothing was permitted, not even simply just being yourself. But you have to remember, those guys in the van sold me on the idea that I'd be out by the end of the weekend. I wasn't buying into all the protocol that they were laying out, because I figured all the other kids were just troubled youth. Little did I know, I would spend the next three years of my life locked away in a facility that I didn't even know the location of. Cross Creek was originally an old hotel, so it was just a network of winding halls and connected rooms. Each bedroom had two sets of bunk beds, so four kids could sleep within. Because of the nature of the building, when you arrived, you weren't allowed outside again. What I mean is that some kids arrived at this place, stepped inside, and then never got a breath of fresh air ever again for at least a year or two. The school was set up on a level system, one through six. The lower level kids were typically still problematic and couldn't be trusted to go outside at all. Everything that we needed could be found indoors. Cross Creek was located in Laverkin, Utah, but being from another state, I didn't know where that was. I had a rough idea where Salt Lake was, but even then, it was useless information because there was no way I could get there. I heard horror stories from the staff and older students about kids that tried to run. First, it was intervention, which is just a form of isolation. If they heard or saw anything that implied that somebody might run, they'd just start the punishment as a preliminary, nip it in the bud, so to speak. But whenever someone talked like that, the staff would just simply remind them how far out we actually were. Laverkin only had a population of three or four thousand people, and none of them would be friendly to obvious escapees, at least not back then. Staff told us that if we escaped, we'd have to at least get to the next town before anyone would help us. They promised that the elements would take us long before we actually found a friendly face. So for that first stint, I just bided my time, followed the rules. I was one of the kids that was going home, but then Monday came and went, and my family never showed up. A week went by. I kept asking, Hey, when do I get to leave? I was sure there'd been some kind of mix-up. A mistake. I'd be out soon. I think a lot of us were telling ourselves this story. We were all up to our eyeballs in disciplinary actions and denial. During my time there, which was either 2006 through 2009 or 2007 through 2010, there were maybe around 70 of us in the program total, and that's just the boys. I have no clue how many girls were held on the other side of the property. I don't know what kind of hell they even went through. We would only encounter them a couple of times a week, just in passing for only maybe a minute, and we were faced to the wall the entire time. If you were caught peeking, it was an instant intervention, isolation. You get the picture. Out of those 70 boys, we were broken down into groups of six, this kept everything much more manageable for the staff and upperclassmen. The smaller the group, the easier it was to break and control us. It also kept us busy on a revolving circuit of stuff to do. Lastly, we weren't allowed to talk to anyone outside of our group. This was a crucial step in keeping us demoralized and scattered under pressure. For three years, I was only allowed to talk to the same five or six souls. It was like prison, maybe worse, and I stand by that. Our daily routine on days would look like this. 
We were woken up at 6 a.m. sharp. I had a small window to get our morning chores done. Brush our teeth, wash our faces, go to the bathroom, and obviously make our beds. Then we would file into the dining hall for breakfast. The food was garbage, as I'm sure you already know, and there was never enough of it. Food was a device for control at Cross Creek. If you found yourself in intervention, the isolation cells, you could find yourself begging for food, and I'm not even exaggerating. The staff would lock you up and then quote unquote forget to bring you a meal for two or even three days. You'd be lucky to eat a banana peel or something left over in the trash can that a passing staff member would give to you. After breakfast was school, the entire reason that we were supposed to be there. This was the biggest block of time throughout our day, wherein all the group would be taken into the study room, which was like a big empty lounge. Think of the common area of a hotel, and then imagine it's been filled with desks, printers, and some other school shit. We called the school, but let me make it clear, absolutely nothing educational went on there. It was five hours of self-motivated book work. There would be a unit to study with a quiz at the end, and if you didn't pass that quiz, you didn't move on. No staff or upperclassmen helped us at all, even if we really needed it. The group that I was in was a bunch of newbies, so we didn't think to put our heads together and try to get the work done for everyone. We just mess around, make paper airplanes, the usual detention kind of behavior. There was something that I liked about it at first. It's almost like what every kid wants school to be, done at your own pace, no teachers to pester you, no timeline to get it done. It was also explained to us, the quickest a student could finish the Cross Creek program was 13 months and that involved high daily output in academics, but also a whole slew of other boxes to check, like passing seminars. 13 months sounded like forever to a bunch of abducted children who weren't allowed to go outside, so we would just do as much as we could. But after a couple of weeks, I quickly realized what was going on. There was no way for a lower level student to ever get ahead. Unless you came to Cross Creek with a seriously gifted individual, or even just book smart, you were gonna fall behind with all the schoolwork. Of course, now that the docu-series is out, we all know this was a scheme to keep kids in the program longer, which kept their parents footing the bill longer. The money didn't keep coming in if the kids were being sent home. After five hours of school, we'd be given a break and sent to lunch, again more of that trash food, and kids at this point would be pretty pissed off to the point of aggression. Some kids fought each other, but most of them wanted to fight the staff. The lunchroom was like an arena for all of this stuff. But who am I kidding? We all did it, every single last one of us. We came here as troubled youth, stolen from our homes. So many of our natural instincts were to resist, fight back at any opportunity, and lunch was that window. We'd see kids getting thrown into walls, slammed into tables, and then hauled off for the intervention wing. There was no winning only jamming up the machine that was Cross Creek. And even then, we all still lost in the end. After lunch, we were allowed one hour to do whatever we wanted. If you had a certain amount of points or were a certain level, you could go outside. If you were new, low ranked or a problem of any kind, you would always remain indoors. You'd be lucky to get a board game, usually just be sent to do chores and cleaning, landscaping, whatever they wanted. That's the other thing about these facilities. You weren't just a student when you went there. You were a staff member too. Every single one of us did work of some kind every single day. Low levels were grunts, so you had to do manual labor like cleaning bathrooms and landscaping around the facility. Even that could be a relief though. Just getting touched by the sun was a reminder that we weren't in hell and life could be normal possibly again one day. Thinking back now, we did almost everything, even the cooking. There would be typically one staff member that ran a job, but really, it was just selecting the kids to do it, then show them how to complete each job properly. After that free hour, we would go back inside to our group rooms, where we would watch educational videos and take more quizzes on those videos. Again, if you didn't pass, you just watched it again. It was mind-numbing, but it was something to pass the time, I guess. After that, we were allowed to read for one hour, from books pre-selected by the facility. Lots of literary classics, lots of self-help, and lots of brainwashing books. 
There's a cool down time called casual hour, where we could talk to our group members and any staff or upperclassmen that came into the room. It was like a decompression. They'd ask us what we learned or what we focused on. Go over the nails in the coffin, so to speak. Looking back, I think this was a diffusion method so kids wouldn't be fighting in the dining room again like they did at lunch. Once dinner was over, we cycled through the showers and then it was lights out by 9 p.m. If it was a bad day and lots of kids were in intervention, sometimes they make us go to sleep early or take our pillows away. Anything to make that night even worse. Weekends were pretty much non-existent. Again, if it was a good week, we might be allowed to watch a movie or listen to classical music in the dining hall. Some of us would write letters to our families. Others would just write in our journals. And the upperclassmen would sometimes take trips to go to work at places around town. This was all part of their curriculum to go home. Volunteer programs for different things in the community. That was another factor. Your family could come visit once a month. Or if you were always making trouble, maybe every other month. The school would literally come up with lies and excuses for your family not to see you. This might give time for the bruises to go away, or a black eye to settle, stuff like that. Regardless, having visitors brought a little bit of hope to us kids trapped inside Cross Creek. Like I told you earlier, I didn't think I would be attending Cross Creek for that long. Because of that, I didn't bother to make any friends. I didn't socialize or do any of the bonding exercises. Honestly, I hated everyone in there and everyone around me, at least at first. This was my first dance with getting disciplined. Being unsocial was against the rules. So, as you can guess, I was punished for it. And you know what I did? I fought tooth and nail. They came for me to do the intervention a month or so later, I think, I can't remember. And when they came into the room, I started to trip out. Me, I hadn't done anything wrong. You aren't making friends or making good decisions, the staff explained to me. We want to help your behavior. So, I started to fight. I mean, what kind of nonsense was I hearing? I was doing everything they expected of me, short of talking to my peers. And now, that was landing me in trouble? No way, not me. The issue was I was 15 and trying to fight three grown men. One of them wrapped me up, subdued my arms, and the other guy grabbed me by my throat and shoulder and then slammed me into the ground. I remember looking up at the lights and thinking, surely these men are about to kill me. Why else would all this be happening? I panicked and started to fight harder, only to be rolled over, pinned down, and then sat on by all three of these dudes. I'm talking 600 pounds of agitated fat and muscle, crushing my teenage body into the tile. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't see. I flexed against the pressure with every ounce of my strength, literally until I passed out underneath them. They said it was for me hyperventilating, but hey, it was probably both. All I know is I woke up to being dragged down the hall into the intervention wing, where I was shoved into a small room without windows, and the door was locked from the outside. This was my first experience with the measures taken to correct my behavior. I mean it when I say I was kept in there for three weeks. I felt like I was going insane, absolutely cracking up. A day in there could feel like a month, an hour could feel like 10 minutes. It made no sense. Sometimes they'd turn the lights off just to mess with me. I will admit though, their tactics were effective. It was hard to slip up after being isolated for two or three weeks. The risk never outweighed the reward, even if there was something you really wanted to do or say. Sometimes a new kid would show up and try to start a fight and it was hard not to take the bait. Those of us had been inside for a while, knew what would happen if we fought them. But damn, if we didn't want to get some aggression out, let some of these punks know what was up at Cross Creek. Personally, I never got into any fights with anyone but staff. Once I saw the system for what it was, I stuck to their rules and played the stupid game. We didn't have to just satisfy the staff, but the other students too. Once you make it into the upper levels of the program, your peers had to vote on whether you passed or failed your exams and seminars. This created a landscape wherein every petty action might ruin your chances of going home. The staff was putting us against each other in a way and making the whole thing political. This actually worked to benefit me though, as I've always kind of been a charming guy, 
I told lies up and down to some of those kids to get them to support me. And that's what the game called for. We had to look out for one another to a certain degree. And when that didn't work, we had to be able to lie our asses off. I'd parlay with some peers in exchange for passing reviews, only to turncoat and sell them out for bad behavior and gain even more points from the staff. Of course, those kids would pressure me with questions. I'd lie and say I never ratted them out. It was all messed up, but it was the only way to go home. You have to remember, my mom had been dead for a couple of years at this point. I had no home. I didn't even have any idea where I'd land after I graduated. But anywhere was better than Cross Creek. While I was at the facility, my aunt and uncle came to visit me only three times. Three visits in three years. And I have a little brother. Our mom passed and then we were split apart, cast to the wind by people who didn't give a shit about us. I missed him all the time. That was the most horrific part of Cross Creek and its methods of correction. During some of our seminars and casual discussions, naturally some students would get upset, cry, scream, whatever. There's a time that I can recall getting upset just because I missed my mom. I didn't understand why this was all happening to me. The talk just hit some kind of trigger and I turned into a hot mess. The staff told me that perhaps it was my fault my mother had died in that car accident. They reasoned that my poor choices and my bad behavior were directly correlated to her death. Maybe she even crashed her car on purpose just to be free of me. To this day, that was some of the most damaging stuff that I've ever heard and hurt me in a way that I don't know how to recover from. I'm in my 30s now, but I can remember my teenage self not knowing how to cope with or even process what they were saying to me. What the staff didn't know was that they stoked a fire inside me once they said those words, that I was the reason my mom was dead. I knew that moment I would beat these people and get out of here, and that's exactly what I did. I'm an adult now. I've got a kiddo of my own, a house and a truck, a good job that I love. Cross Creek is long gone from my mind, but when that docuseries dropped, I was overloaded with memories of my time inside the program. I couldn't believe how much of my youth was completely blacked out from my memory. When I saw people sharing their experiences, I started doing the same. Knowledge is power, right? Many of these schools aren't around anymore, but variations of them still exist in some places. Hopefully we can all do our part to make sure no one has to endure them themselves. In the fall of 2023, I, a 14-year-old girl, found myself in a memorable situation. My band focused on cover songs and I had this small gig downtown at a cafe at around 8 in the evening. For privacy reasons, I'm not going to disclose the town. Let's just say it wasn't the safest place around. The cafe was on Main Street, spread across three blocks with rundown buildings and businesses scattered in sections. After our performance was done, Amidst the congratulatory buzz, I stepped outside for a quick breather. The plan was also to stroll to the parking lot and grab some gifts for our band teachers. It was a fall transitioning into winter, so it was pretty dark outside already. Some broken street lights added to that challenge. I took a right, a short walk to the car, when my evening took an unexpected turn. Just to give you a quick layout, I had to walk about 200 feet to the left before hitting an intersection. Crossing it led to a right turn, revealing a long sidewalk with trees and abandoned buildings on the right side. On the left, after about 100 feet, was the parking lot where my mom had parked her car way in the back. This wasn't really a particularly dangerous part of town or anything, but just about everywhere becomes a little more hectic when the sun goes down, especially downtown areas inside inner cities. It's almost like the sun itself sets on morality and suddenly those who want to harm others could come out and skulk a little more confidently. As I turned right at the street corner, walked down that long sidewalk to my mom's car, something caught my eye about 50 feet ahead. There stood a small electrical box, a familiar sight due to the graffiti cat that was on it. But as I got closer, something just felt off. 
The darkness made it hard to see, but it seemed like someone was crouching down and just peering at me. Being a big horror fan, I stopped dead in my tracks and my senses were now on high alert. Straining my eyes to make sense of it, I cautiously walked closer. My fears were confirmed as that figure behind that box slowly rose. The dim street light revealed a silhouette of a tall, disheveled man. Fear gripped me, and though I tried to turn and run, that same fear kept me frozen. He circled around the box, now heading straight for me. It turned into this weird standoff, as there were some cars drifting throughout the road, so I couldn't just bolt across the street if he turned out to be seriously dangerous. But because those cars were so near, I think he also hesitated in what he wanted to do. I couldn't run and he couldn't attack me, but we both went into motion anyway. I honestly think his intention was to approach me and try to lure me back into the dark. It's the only logical explanation that I can think of, other than just literally dragging me back into the parking lot. Either way, he was still walking right at me and starting to pick up speed. In that flight or fight moment, I raced to the street corner and began pressing the walk button multiple times. It wasn't fast enough though, and he was closing in. Ignoring that walk sign, I sprinted back down the road, then illegally crossed the road the second there wasn't any cars. My parents were puzzled by my abrupt turn, but I just brushed off their questions. I haven't shared this incident with anyone, unsure if they'd even believe me. And involving police seems kind of pointless since technically, he hadn't really done anything. His intentions still remain unknown, but one thing was for sure, they couldn't have been good. A little bit of background info. I'm from Madrid, Spain. My family is from a small mountain city. We're all familiar with the mountains. I would also not consider us to be very superstitious and or believe strongly in supernatural events, although I am a huge fan of folklore. The story also happened in the summer. So back when I was 14 years old, my mother took me and my brother for a week-long trip in the mountain range in the southeast of Spain. We had already spent half of the week going on multiple hikes, and we visited beautiful lakes where me and my brother would swim, despite them being kind of cold. Overall, we had a lot of fun, and we were just enjoying our small family trip so far. One day, while it was very sunny and warm, we went on another hike to this kind of abandoned trail, which some of the locals of the village had recommended to us. It wasn't accessible by car, so there was no phone service either. We really couldn't care less. We loved to spend time in nature. We would just spend our time walking and talking instead of being on our phones. We ended up finding this crystal clear lake with beautiful turquoise greenish water with lots of water vegetation inside it. My brother and I immediately jumped in and afterwards we had a picnic for lunch. So far so good, right? Suddenly out of nowhere, while we were enjoying our lunch, we heard a loud scream. It was very high pitched and just overall very scary. Considering the fact that we were next to the lake in a very small valley between tall mountains, we could also hear it kind of echo. All three of us immediately looked at one another, startled. We were certainly not imagining anything. From what we could deduce, the sound had come from the other side of the lake, inside this very bushy area. The lake itself wasn't very big, so we decided to make our way around and investigate that sound. Although we had not seen anyone else during that entire day out there, maybe somebody was actually in danger or needed our help. I can't really specify what the scream sounded like. In hindsight, it wasn't your typical scream for help, but who knows what humans are capable of sounding like when they're in dire need of help, right? After a 20 minute walk, we were getting really close to the entrance of that bushy area on the other side of the lake. All three of us approached with our walking sticks in hand and inside a cautious position. The first thing that we noticed was this awful smell. Together with that scream earlier, it all made us feel this sense of dread. Normally you'd think you'd feel welcome when helping someone out, but we did not have that feeling at all inside this place. My instincts were telling me we should backtrack our way out of there, quickly. 
However, we couldn't shake the feeling that we just had to help somebody, especially if they needed it. So we slowly decided to proceed. The joy and laughter that we had on the other side of the lake were no more. Whatever was going on this side felt wrong and ominous. I cannot talk on my mother or my brother's behalf, but I know my hair and my arms stood on end. After making our way through the bush for 10 minutes, we were finally reaching a clearing. During this whole time, that sense of dread had continued, growing and growing, and that awful smell had only increased as well. Finally, once in the middle of that clearing, we saw what was causing the smell. In what seemed to be the perfect middle and center of that clearing, we found the dead corpse of a deer, or at least what remained of it. The limbs were all removed from its torso, and the head was half eaten. The thing is, it looked fairly fresh, as if it was killed the same day. However, the smell that emitted from it was like a days old rotting and decaying corpse. It didn't make any sense. We checked for footprints or anything else in the clearing, but didn't find anything. A logical explanation would be wolves, or maybe even bears, since we have both of them in rural Spain. However, the missing footprints and the way the deer was just made it almost seem unnatural. After we checked the surroundings, we left as quickly as we could. On our way back, we did not stop and rest at the lake or anything else. We just wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. When we were leaving the valley behind us, halfway up one of the surrounding mountains, we heard another one of those screams, similar to that first one. However, this time, we did not feel the urgency to check if someone needed help. Instead, we all picked up our speed and didn't look back. Somewhere in the evening, we finally made it back to our village. We went for dinner in our small old town bar in the picturesque town square. We talked to some of the older folks from the village about our experience that day with that abandoned trail. They told us somewhere along the line, we'd taken a wrong turn on that trail since it was not very clear. And this was the reason that we ended up in the valley with the lake. They also told us that supposedly a few centuries back during the Spanish Inquisition, the local townspeople had gone into that valley because a so-called witch lived there and set her house on fire, killing that poor woman. Since then, the locals never hiked close to the lake or its surroundings in the valley. A couple of days later, we left to go back home, but we've never been able to shake that feeling of dread that we experienced that day. Again, and I can't say this enough, we are not a superstitious family or even big believers of the supernatural itself what happened on that day. It's definitely weird. I have this fuzzy memory growing up on this scary night with a babysitter. Her name was Meg and she would watch me and my little sister maybe like two or three nights a week. We were young, only eight and five years old so a lot of these memories are kind of hazy. Honestly, I wrote most of them off as absolutely nothing, while others seem to have actually been blocked off completely. There's one night that stands out a little more clearly than the others. I even got some confirmation over the years that this actually happened. It was a pretty average afternoon. The babysitter got there around five or six, and would watch us until 10 or 11 at night. Not that crazy of a stretch, but it's the time when the sun goes down and everything gets dark. We lived outside of town a little bit, so our backyard was mostly forest. Meg would let us play outside until it was time for dinner. We ate dinner around 8 p.m. Late, I know, but when we had a babysitter, we just kind of made our own rules. We would even stay up until mom and dad got home, if we wanted to. Anyway, we played outside for an hour or two. Meg just kind of sat on a rock and watched us run around. We threw a ball around for our dog, Biggie, who was just this muscle-bound mutt that we kept in the backyard. He was a nice dog, but had this crazy string of violent tendencies if he got too energetic. We'd find dead birds, dead rabbits, dead squirrels, whatever he could catch on his 20-foot length of chain. It was a pretty average day, but I remember one thing being weird. I remember catching the scent of cigarette smoke. This was the mid-90s. Both my parents smoked. Everyone smoked so it was a familiar placeable smell for me. 
The issue of that is, it was just me and my sister out there in the woods, so I didn't know where that was coming from. Our closest neighbor was easily a half a mile down the road. Then it occurred to me, Meg was much older than us, probably 18 to 20. I knew older kids got into things like smoking and drinking, and suddenly I had this dreadful feeling that Meg was the one that was smoking. I don't know why, but that weirdly scared me, like there was a secret side to our babysitter that I didn't know, and so I couldn't trust her. I remember then feeling solely responsible for my little sister's safety. We went back into the house as it got darker, and Meg was waiting for us by the porch steps. We weren't that far off, just playing in the brush along the creek out back. We followed Meg up the stairs and through the back door, picked up our shoes and talked about what we wanted to eat for dinner. In the back of my mind, that cigarette smell lingered, and I wondered what other secrets Meg could be keeping from us. We settled on hot dogs and macaroni and cheese, a childhood favorite meal for my sister and I. We lived inside a two-story house, and oddly enough, our kitchen was actually on the second floor, along with the bathroom and this massive master bedroom with a connected bathroom. Downstairs was the living room, kids' bedroom, a storage room, and one full bathroom. Simple layout, but because it was dinner time, all three of us were upstairs. While Meg's making dinner, my sister and I are playing checkers at the kitchen table. We were all laughing, making jokes and whatever. It was summertime, all the windows are open. Suddenly, I could smell the scent of a cigarette again, but this time a little more faint. I turn to look at Meg, and sure enough, she's just simply cooking food for us. No smoke in sight. I knew then that whatever I was smelling was coming from somewhere else. I had painted Meg as the perp purely because we lived that far out. Who else could it be? I turned and looked out the open window and thought maybe it was blowing in from somewhere else. It wasn't uncommon to see hikers wandering the trail sometimes, but either way, once the food got set in front of me, I completely forgot about it. My worries had gone away. We all sat down and kept the good vibes going. There was a break in the conversation where we all took a moment to breathe and just enjoy our food, and I'll never forget what we heard then. It was the sound of the back door gently being closed. It had a big piece of rubber along the bottom trim that made this kind of whooshing noise against the tile. No matter how quiet you were, you could hear that sound from anywhere in the house. I remember looking up for my food to find Meg looking back and forth between us. Painted across her face was real horror the confirmation that we needed. There was someone inside our house, or someone had just left. Either way, we all collectively knew the back door was unlocked because we just used it. My little sister was the last one in, and she definitely didn't lock it. I don't even think she was in first grade at the time. Meg had a great reaction to the whole thing. She got us up quickly from the table and ushered us into our parents' room. It had this big locking hardwood door, pretty secure at least enough to give us a few moments. She also did it all in a way that prevented us from panicking. That's what was so cool about it. She got us up like, oh yeah, there's this cool thing I forgot to show you guys, come here. Then led us into the room. Then she went back into the kitchen, grabbed the home phone and a knife from the butcher block, then returned to the bedroom. She locked the door and went back into distraction mode, all smiles and diversion. My little sister honestly had no idea there was any kind of danger, and I only had a rough idea of what was going on, at least at first. Soon, I could hear the heavy footsteps of someone coming up the stairs. They were painfully slow. They were painfully slow, and I remember they literally drowned out whatever Meg was saying to us. I knew in that moment, whatever I heard was real, and we were suddenly in the middle of it. Meg heard those footsteps too. We quickly pulled up the phone and dialed the number to the bar that my parents were at. We listened as she quietly explained the situation to them. She thought someone had broken in. We'd all barricade ourselves onto the second floor in the bedroom. That's when I remember smelling cigarette smoke again that I'd caught outside. I told Meg about it. She relayed the info that I'd been smelling cigarettes outside around the house. Someone had maybe been casing the place. Hell, they might have been watching us the whole time and saw us use the back door and figured it might be open. My parents said they were rushing home, but even then, the bar itself was like 15 minutes away. 
There was no cell phone service and they weren't that common at the time. So Meg said bye and hung up. The second she did, whoever was inside started walking around the kitchen. They did two laps around the kitchen table before they stopped. I imagine they looked over the food and plates and got an idea of the head count, how many kids there were, etc. To this day, I don't know why this person came inside our house. They came to the bedroom door and tried the handle. This time it was locked. Meg actually screamed this time, which caused the person to bang on the door a couple of times. Not once did they ever say a word, never even uttered a single threat. But they stood out there, trying to force that door open for a few agonizing minutes. Then we heard a car roaring up the dirt road towards the house. The home invader casually strolled back through the kitchen, down the stairs, and then through the back door all at the same pace they'd come in at, that painstakingly slow pace. I swear they stopped as they stepped through the back door, and I heard my parents come through the front and call out our names. They came upstairs and found us all huddled and crying in their bedroom. They called the police who came out and took a look around, but nothing really came up. There weren't any reports of stalkers, home invaders, or people casing properties. So whatever it was, it was isolated. My parents got way more serious about home security after that. And our babysitters started bringing friends along. One of the scariest things to ever happen to my family. And my little sister doesn't even remember it. Hell, I barely do.